So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz and I'm here from the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College in New York. And uh, this is a part of the INSTAR uh, exhibit here at Documenta 15, the Institute for Artivismo of Hannah Arendt. Um, Artivismo as art and activism through Hannah Arendt, which is based in Cuba and uh, was founded by the artist Tanya Bruguera, who um, I've had the pleasure of, of working with and teaching with for a number of years now. Unfortunately, Tanya can't be in Germany for visa issues right now, but she's watching us online in, in New York, in Cambridge, where she's teaching at Harvard. Um, this uh, is, we're having three talks. We had one yesterday. This is part of the final in-star exhibit here at Documenta, which will begin tomorrow morning open in the room right behind me, uh, in which there will be um, uh, a chance to read and think about uh, Hannah Arendt's book, um, Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, which is the book, part of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, this panel today uh, is one I'm very excited about. Uh, I have three incredibly distinguished guests and speakers and panelists who will be you'll be hearing from. Uh, the first on my right here is Thomas Meyer, who teaches at Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Uh, he has a new, he's the editor of a new series of Hannah Arendt's books, including this new one, which just came out, Eichmann in Jerusalem, which he'll be talking about today. Uh, he's also the author of a forthcoming biography of Hannah Arendt, which will be published next year, 2023, by Pieper in German and in 2024 by Penguin uh, in English. So look out for those. Um, to his right, uh, Renata Stee uh, is a Berlin-based artist, uh, teaches at a number of places, lectures all over the world, shows all over the world. And with next to her is her partner, uh, Frieder Schnuck, who uh, also lectures and teaches all over the world, including both of them at uh, Leuphana University here in Germany. Frieder was also the curator at the Museum Friedrichianum here in Kassel for a number of years. They have a new exhibit which will be opening next year in Gießen uh, on the uh, German composer Hermann Levy, I mean conductor Hermann Levy. So um, uh, look out for that. And they'll be talking about some of their recent exhibits today. Um, so we look forward to that. So I thought I'd begin uh, by um, sort of framing this question around Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, which for some of you who don't know, Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann was a, uh, originally an Austrian um, uh, man who joined the Nazi party, 
and became uh, part of the Jewish Abteilung of the, uh, of the Gestapo and eventually uh, became responsible for the uh, transportation of Jews to concentration camps uh, across Europe. Um, when he was captured in Argentina uh, by the Israelis in 1960, uh, Hannah Arendt uh, went to the New Yorker and the New Yorker magazine in New York and asked if she could cover the trial and write about it for them. Uh, she said she could never forgive himself so she didn't see in the flesh um, someone like Eichmann, someone who had been responsible in a sense for the transportation of Jews uh, to their deaths throughout Europe. Uh, the book caused an enormous controversy for a whole number of reasons, one of which was the subtitle, The Banality of Evil. Um, people said, oh, she defended Eichmann, or she said he wasn't evil, which of course was not true. She was making a case for what evil is, and that's part of what we're going to talk about today. And the other was um, uh, she was accused of, of blaming the Jews for, um, for participating through the Judenrata, the Jewish leadership councils, and others that often worked with Eichmann uh, and in the camps. Uh, and she was certainly not the only one who made this accusation uh, or talked about this issue. Um, and certainly she did not blame the Jews for the Holocaust, but talked about their implications. And so this controversy over Hannah Arendt's book on how to deal with evil, on how to deal with evil, genocidal evil, has erupted for the last 50 years. The book has 51 years ago published, and or 50 years ago, 63. More or less 60 years. 60 years More ago. or less 60, 60 years. years ago, yeah. And um, almost every year, I can tell you, a new controversy emerges over the book. It's, it never ends. Half my life, I think, is spent responding to people asking, oh, have you heard about the controversy over Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem? Well, I don't have to do that so much anymore because Thomas Meyer uh, has now published a new edition in German of Eichmann in Jerusalem, and he has to deal with the controversies now. Um, but Thomas, let's start there. Why another edition of Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem in 2023? Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for, for, for having me, and uh, thank you for let me participate in this uh, with this distinguished scholars. Can you hear me, or should I raise my voice? You can hear me. Okay. Thank you, Tanya and the team, Laila, and uh, and and the all the, Amita and all the others who were organized this uh, single this uh, event. Um, why not an edition? I mean, the 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 uh, average answer would be. Are, it's a classic. We need always new editions. We, we have new insights. We know, for example, now that Hannah Arendt, who was accused not only for being a self-hatred Jew, or, or for a bad historian, for being a woman, for being or not a specialist of all these events, was also uh, accused for writing too quickly. But we have in the archives nine, nine manuscripts of the book, nine different manuscripts. So she dealt with uh, the manuscript for more than three years, more or less, uh, night and day. And that shows that this book is unique, even in her, her oeuvre. Uh, the idea was to present a new edition simply because we thought... Um, when you say uh, uh, the Eichmann Jerusalem controversies is a trial that never ends, we want to summarize uh, the insights of the last couple of years and present the German public also a different uh, uh, point of view. Uh, in particular, the German ed edition had a very, very, let's say, loosey uh, introduction by Hans Mommsen, a famous German historian, who accused the book again and again. So it was very hard to get through this introduction to the book. And that doubled, so to speak, all the controversies instead, instead of clarifying the controversies. And so we used the opportunity and to present a new edition. So one of the, one of the controversies around the book, as you said, is that sometimes Arendt is called a self-hating Jew and accused of being an anti-Semite. Another is, and this comes from a number of places, including a recent movie, a, bio, a biographical movie about Hannah Arendt, uh, in which on the screen it says, Hannah Arendt said 
Adolf Eichmann was not an anti-Semite. Yeah. She never says that. What does it mean? What does anti-Semitism mean in the question of Adolf Eichmann? <laughs> that's a, Roger. That's really a big question. Yeah. Um, let Let me first of all say that uh, to see the so-called secondary literature and the reviews about the book, it's full of cliches. Uh, uh, and one of the most famous cliches is uh, that Hannah Arendt said that Eichmann was not an anti-Semite. Uh, that is, uh, I mean, people have fantasies, obviously. And this is a book when when they open the, the book, uh, they have an, already an image. They know before reading the book what she said, and that is a complete hearsay. I can show you even in so-called. Uh, uh, doctoral thesis, habilitation, and other books. There are quotes which are quotes from quotes from quotes uh, that do not appear in the book at all. And one is the anti-Semitism. So the A word or the anti uh, Eichmann anti-Semitism is a complex relationship because anti-Semitism is something for Arendt in this context of the Eichmann trial, and I have to specify in this, uh, in this Eichmann trial, uh, that is not enough, so to speak. Uh, there were millions of anti-Semites, but there was one single Eichmann. And to explain the personality and how he functioned in the framework of the Reichssicherheitshauptamt, you cannot translate that seriously. That is a German word, that's a German idea uh, to exterminate uh, more than six million Jews, gypsies, or homosexuals, and so on and so forth. Um, and by the way, as uh, Van Reybroek found out, even in the Dachau camp, people from Indonesia, so we had m m uh, victims in the Dachau camp from Indonesia, who uh, fought uh, in, the, in the underground army in the Netherlands and were brought from the Netherlands to Dachau camp and only two of them survived. So the whole story here, and I don't know if someone from Ruan Krupa with their controversial idea of this curatorship are here, they could easily have combined their story with the story of victims of the Dachau camp. Um, I let that open why that not happened. Okay. Um, back to anti-Semitism at... Uh, well, let me ask the question yeah, okay. this way. Von, Bettina Stangnath and other people have argued that new evidence has emerged that Eichmann was more anti-Semitic than Arendt thought. How important is that? And why do you think it matters or doesn't matter the question of whether Eichmann was, an, was, was, a, was a deep anti-Semite or not? Is it important? Uh, in in our understanding of Arendt's telling of his story? Obviously, it is important for some people. Uh, uh, I don't know what the measure could be to say more anti-Semitic than we thought. Is it 5%? Is that enough? Or 15% or 120%? I have big, big problems to, to react to these kind of categorization. I think it's completely meaningless. Um, and it's not, there's no explanatory background in that uh, when, when you call him an anti-Semite anti or not. The uniqueness, and I'm still a very conservative at this point, I still defend the uniqueness of the whole events and also the uniqueness of this person and his, what he did. Uh, and so to speak, controversially, maybe we can just... Uh, cast that later with the, with the, with the public here. I uh, s uh, could see that also experts are in the public here. Um, I don't care. I don't care if he was an anti-Semite or not. We have the factum putum. We have the facts. And uh, it is one of the side effects of the book that people push Arendt in this direction and say, yeah, you say nothing about his anti-Semitism. Well, I would say please start reading between the lines. That is what we uh, learn in school, and then we get enough from that. Um, and uh, maybe it is also uh, a good idea uh, uh, to see that Eichmann Jerusalem is part of a 
bigger project, so to speak. Uh, and uh, it starts already in the mid-30s when she was in Paris and wrote a 160 pages manuscript about anti-Semitism. And uh, nobody talks, or more or less, nobody talks about the second part of Eichmann Jerusalem, where she gave for the first time in Germany an uh, overview, so to speak, the European project of the extermination of European, European Jewry. So you have a country by country uh, overview about the different experiences of the juries and, and uh, uh, that it was different in Hungary, uh, the most perverse of all killings, and, and Denmark on the opposite side. And um, what is highly interesting, or uh, um, not in the, only in the academia, but also in, in, in the so the public sphere is that people are not willing to historicize. Of course, we know much more than Arendt knew at that time. Of course, there are mistakes in this book. It's not a Torah. It was not written without mistakes. Which book is without mistakes? It's only the, the, the Tanakh. So I'm, what I want to say is when we read this book, we also have to keep in mind that it is a book from 64, and then it was a pioneer work. So last, last point I want to bring up in this short intro is one of the reasons, one of the arguments I think of the book is that, of course, he probably was anti-Semitic. He claims he wasn't. He claims he had Jewish girlfriends. He has this and that. But she says, look, we don't believe you. You know, we don't have to believe you. But she says it's not, that wasn't the key, right? The key is what? What is it that allows someone like Eichmann, who's an anti-Semite, but not an evil, not an evil madman, she says, right? What it is that likes that makes that allows someone like him to be a tool of the bureaucratic mass murder of six million Jews and other peoples? What's the argument? What's the banality of evil? Can you just give us a sense of of how you understand that? How she she thinks that through? I mean. Uh, thank you, uh, Roger. That, that's the, the, another big question. Um, so uh, one can start philosophically that she wanted to replace the concept of the radical evil by Immanuel Kant by something completely different, which also means completely different because that was a unique, unique event. That was that was something that did not happen before. So we cannot simply use the old terminology, the old terms, the old insights by, from, from the, uh, the Kantian philo philosophy. And of course, when I said it a few days before, um, there is a certain tension between the title and the subtitle. And we have to have that in mind, which means there is a name, Eichmann, there is a place, Jerusalem. And then we have a subtitle, which offers a, a concept, a theoretical concept, the banality of evil, and even this kind of, of genitivus, objectivus, or genitivus, subjectivus, which means you can turn it around and give them uh, these two words, a completely different reading, shows us that there is a correlation that was not seen before. And because of that, we need a new terminology. And this terminology is about the complete um, emptiness of responsibility. There was no responsibility that with an empty space. Um, Eichmann could be not addressed in the trial and did not address himself as someone who is responsible for anything. It is like... Uh, I'm sorry for the cliche, like in one of Kafka's novels, there is a bureaucratic system, but you cannot address, they have no name, so to speak, they have no function, but it works when they come together, so to speak. And uh, as you maybe know, the, the, the perversity of the whole story is that uh, Hannah Arendt's lector, uh, Dr. Hans Rüsner, was a colleague of Eichmann. So the editor worked in the same house as uh, Eichmann himself did for a certain time. And that gives the whole thing, so to speak, another reading again, which means the whole book is, works in the, in the German context as a mirror 
of this biocracy in the sense that it could be everybody, but it were specific person who did it. Thank you. So this is a good way to turn to speaking to Renata and Frieder. Um, yeah, on the one hand, Eichmann often said, I was merely uh, doing my job. I was a bureaucrat. And Arendt didn't give him that, right? She, she, re she denied that. She said, you claim you're a cog. We don't see that. We see you as someone who chose to do what you did. And, and we have to, and you have to pay the price for it. You have to take responsibility. And so she fights against this bureaucratization. And she's, the banality of evil, Renata and Frida, is for her something that means, it, 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 okay, he's not a raving mad lunatic, right? But he's still someone who does evil. And his evil is in a kind of willingness to choose to go along thoughtlessly with a system, a bureaucratic system, a legal system, et cetera. You're artists, yeah. and you're artists who have been incredibly um, thoughtfully uh, preoccupied with the question of how to make us think about evil in the modern world and how to do art about this kind of evil. How does one, as an artist, think about the banality of evil? Well, that's a very good question, Roger. First of all, thank you for having us here. It's quite amazing uh, after all these years coming to Documenta since my childhood, and it's quite a new experience to be questioned about this kind of work. Uh, and also, hi, Tanya, I'm so sorry you're not here. I keep looking where, where you are <laughs> in this uh, uh, digital universe. And uh, yeah, it's, I think what one can do as an artist is, is a bit different, but it's still rather similar. And, uh, and what Thomas does is always very helpful because you can dig into that. It's the base to create artwork. Artwork is the mirror to reality. Artwork is the answer to many things. It can act actually in rather different ways and artists can develop different methodologies to answer any kind of question. Of course, when you think about the Holocaust, it is highly upsetting. And so as it is so highly upsetting, uh, you have to control yourself. You have to keep your mind together. You have to control your emotions, which is not easy. Anger is, is a very good tool. And when we started a project, which I'm going to show to you in a minute, uh, anger was actually the motivation to say, hey, we are going to do something that will be there and people will see it. And that's what art can do. I mean, you know, ab kind of theory is abstract and you have to read things to know about it. Art is visual and it's there and you have to develop really interesting tools to uh, approach the audience. Most important is don't offend. Most important is create a communication, create interactivity and, you know, their Documenta is also a wonderful school for that. I mean, uh, when I think about Joseph Boris, when I think about his work and how he created these kind of upsetting things like the honey machine or so, you can really look at, at moments where you can step in and do it. And uh, I would like to start with the first picture. Um, go. Yeah, In Incidents of Living Experience, a quotation from Hannah Arendt, and you see the city Berlin from the air. When you fly into Berlin, that's what you get. Uh, at that time, I guess it's an old picture. We used to have snow. We don't have snow anymore. And it's also not cold anymore, right? Um, but that's the Tiergarten, and, and that's... Uh, uh, the moved uh, uh, victory column, and so on. We could go on about it. What's really interesting about Berlin and working there is that there are always discourses. In Berlin, there is always a discussion about everything. And if we're right, Thomas, I mean, it's always there. And so uh, somebody will always host a discussion. That's where we all start. And then uh, 
the Senate is approached, the Senate is our government, Berlin is a city and a state at the same time, and then they can actually um, allow to, uh, a project to be developed in public space, for example. And public space is a really interesting tool uh, to uh, approach people in a different way. Public space can be the digital world, it's also public space, but public space can also be the street, like Benjamin wrote, the passers-by. How do you reach them? How do they wake up and look at something? And, uh, and so I, I'm also, uh, I was the longtime chair of the Art Advisory Board of the Senate of Berlin, where I'm still serving in my function uh, and the board. And we try to create discussions about certain squares, moments, and so on. Now, coming back to, um, uh, to Berlin's, uh, the, to your question, L make long story short. Next picture, please. Yeah, and what you see here is uh, Humboldt University, the main building, and uh, you see um, a square. It's the view from the Hotel du Rhum, a luxury hotel, from the roof terrace, and you look down, and what you see is a little light, and this is the square where the Nazis burned books of people they hated, people they had been following up since the early 20s. They kept lists, and the moment they came to power, they started erasing the memory of them. Erasing the memory is always a tool of fascism, of dictators of any kind, left and right. We had Stalin, you know, call that left, I don't know, but also left and right. I mean, totalitarian systems are always the same. They are stupid. And so they think they are afraid of knowledge and of discussions. So this is just the other side of it. Um, Misha Ullman, the Israeli artist Misha Ullman, created this incredible sculpture, one of my favorite artworks, that, he, that you look inside this little lit windows. And does anyone know? Has anyone seen that? Do you know what you see? No? What, you have to go to Berlin and you have to see it. It is, there are empty bookshelves. Very simple. So you have a souterrain room and you see these empty bookshelves and you know exactly what it is about. You, 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 you guess somehow. And it's just across from the university library. So it's still happening there and on the other side is the State Opera House. Unter den Linden, which is, you know, covered with all kinds of memorials. So you have a sculpture, which is a memorial to the burned books in 33. And that's very interesting. And, um, and that was actually after Frieda and I started to work on certain projects. Next, please. And one is, yeah. So what you see here is an old map of Berlin. Maybe Frieda, you want to explain a little bit. Uh, coming back to Misha Ullmann, for sure, when you do an artwork, a label is always important. And if you look around finding help for this lit window and the empty shelves, there is a plaque on the ground. And it says, it's a quotation from Heinrich Heine, first they burn books and then they burn people. And that for sure explains it. And uh, it's early, it's 33. And uh, we were... Um, interested in a competition in 92 and uh, it happened uh, in the district of Schöneberg. You see it uh, there, it's a Bavarian quarter uh, on the map and this is a map from 1907, uh, Faro's map anyway. And uh, so what do you do when you do something in public um, space? You do research, you go there, you uh, go to archives and uh, you interview people and you get answers. And uh, this district wanted to have a memorial for the murdered Jews coming from that part of town. And uh, next, please. Um, yeah, and so we show you some people who lived in this so-called Bavarian Quarter in Berlin-Schöneberg. Uh, and you see Hannah Arendt up there, she lived there briefly. Marlene Dietrich lived in another part of Schöneberg, but it's so important to name her. 
uh, and Albert Einstein, he lived in the middle of it. He lived there till 32 before leaving for, uh, for Princeton University and never came back. And you have Giselle Freund, the photographer, uh, and then Karl Einstein and um, uh, Gertrude Kolmar, yes. And so just to name some of them. So you see there is this kind of intellectual group of people. Uh, the founder of this quarter, um, was uh, a name uh, was Mr. Haviland, who was a very socially engaged man, created all kind of uh, th this quarter in a very open way. So you had expensive apartments, cheap apartments, you know, this kind of structure that made actually Berlin be the city, what it is sort of till today. And, um, and so they, um, of course, uh, uh, this was a part of town where Jewish citizens from all over Berlin had been brought to before deportation. Just to give you a brief, I can't go into really the deep. And uh, next, please. And so um, when the Senate started uh, Place of Remembrance, and next, please. And uh, when the Senate of Berlin uh, uh, called for, for input in the, uh, it was an open competition, um, then uh, we said, okay, we'll step in, we'll look what to do. And we were walking around with hidden recorders and interviewing people, and we got the weirdest answers. Some a woman said, I said, do you know where people who had lived here are now? And she said, oh, they are all in Israel, and stuff like that. So people have, you know, their, they create their illusions and their fantasies about and cor correct his, try to correct history. And we said, oh, Okay, we'll help and we'll make a memorial that will not be on the Bavarian Square, which was in the middle of this, this structure uh, in, in Schöneberg. We will create something that is spread out and that exposes evil, that exposes these anti-Jewish laws and regulations. And we, we went to the uh, House der Wannsee Conference, where, you know, the place of the last... Uh, Eichmann, Eichmann was doing the protocol uh, when Heinrich brought in all the bureaucrats to tell them I'm responsible for the final solution. Yeah, and so um, we found these regulations which had been disturbed, uh, dispersed everywhere, long story short, and then started creating, um, we picked 80 uh, laws which were based on daily life structures and connected them to, let's say, banal, naive images that would kind of create a communication, not only with the audience, but also among generations, that children would be interested seeing what they see and to have uh, and ask their grandparents, parents and grandparents, what they could do. What you see here is an app we created in 2020, beginning of 2020, which is actually something you can download. You can put your phone there and you can virtually walk around the area. It's multilingual, there are translations, something that didn't exist in 93, where there wasn't even internet, there wasn't even a website or anything. It's hard to imagine for younger generations how that was before you could really get the information, you know. I think that's why dictators always block the internet, because it is so open and it unveils crime and all these things. Okay, and so uh, next please. Well, we'll shorten that up a little bit, otherwise it's uh, too long. So um, you see there is a picture, it's a score, and the score um, is basically uh, to whom God wants to show his mercy, uh, he will send him out in the wide, wide world, right? And it's connected to singing clubs, you know, the Meistersinger idea and all that, chanson de l'Eurovision and all that. It's the, the clubs where people sing together, something really popular in Germany, at least since Walter von der Vogelweide we know and since Middle Ages, however. And so we put that up on lampposts and used a public structure to um, make people walk around and read the crime. So actually you, could, you can uh, create your own um, memorial by walking the way you want to. So next, please. 
yeah, that's the back side. You see, it's written in German. That's why we needed an app to in in multi uh, languages to to so people can translate and understand it. And so Jews are expelled from these singing clubs already in '33. Something very emotional, singing, liberating. This has been taken away. So what we tried to do was, next please, to um, kind of so show the structure and the seriousness of uh, Nazi totalitarianism. So it is exposing evil, really exposing. And of course, it upsets people, you know. It is, uh, we just uh, uh, recently uh, uh, heard uh, from the director of the uh, Museum of uh, History in Berlin. He said, this is a disgusting memorial. Yes, not the memorial is disgusting. The Nazis' laws are disgusting. It's a big difference, right? Some people don't know the difference. And uh, so here you have uh, a, a Nazi term, Friedrich. For sure, you always think about what could be the right image um, to go with this regulation. Uh, just honorable um, Germans um, can have an allotment garden, and that's a regulation from March 38. And we thought, okay, let's take the radishes, because there is this saying in German, to see the radishes from below. That means for sure you'll be killed. And so the radishes have a double meaning for sure. Next one. And I think there is another one uh, of these series. There's always so much to say, you see, and it, you get, do get emotional the moment you start reading this laws and regulations, you don't believe it because you see how profound the Nazis were in their structure of evil, how they try to basically approach people in every part of daily life and wherever they were, whatever they did, wherever they were working. This, of course, is one of the most emotional signs. Jews are not allowed to have household pets and, and, and the cat with it. Uh, and uh, first the animals had to go and then people could be deported. So as the Bavarian Quarter in Schöneberg was used as a deport deportation site uh, people had to abandon their animals from the beginning, and if they wouldn't do it, uh, the Gestapo would come and, uh, and, and, and they, you know, deport them right away. So, uh, and when we installed this sign, this was the first sign we installed, a man opened the window and said, you Jew yelled outside, you Jewish pigs go away. Ihr Judenschweine geht weg. And so, we were, of course, I mean, that was in 93. And the two craftsmen who were installing uh, the memorial, they said to us, you know, everybody knows about these crimes. Why would do we need another memorial like that? And then I said to them, just because of that. That's, and this is why we made it so obvious. We exposed this evil structure. And that's what... It was here, next please. But it was a huge discussion. It went on for one and a half years in the town hall of Schöneberg, uh, as you may know, uh, used to be uh, uh, the, um, hosted the government of Berlin and so on. And this is the last regulation from February 45, which proves that the Nazis were fully aware of their crime because they say files dealing with anti-Jewish activities are to be destroyed. That means just to kill any kind of evidence. So it took many, many years to bring this anti-Jewish laws together. And that was done by a Mr. Balk, uh, who was 93 years old by then, and uh, to whom we sent also a publication. And he said, well, you surely made a more interesting use of all these laws than I did. And, and next one, just another discourse right after this was bus stop. And bus stop was our concept for the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, which was called Memorial to the Murder Jews of Europe. And we said, you don't need to install things on the spot because in Berlin, all over Berlin, all over around Berlin, there are camps and in the immediate neighborhood in Poland, in the Czech Republic, 
you have all these camps, and these are not all of them. These are just some. So make it visible, make it clear, go there together, talk about it, make it aware that you can prevent such crime in the future, once and forever. Next, please. Yeah, and so the idea was to get buses, the red buses that would have, you know, uh, um, the title on it with Buchenwald. And you would, instead of go to Munich, you would simply go drive to Buchenwald with a group of people and discuss things together. It caused a lot of trouble. Uh, I mean, how, I, it's, it was very strange that it would cause so much. And next one, I think then we are basically through. Next picture, please. Yeah, and then we created, of course we couldn't do that, but we created um, schedules that you could take with you. Nowadays you could again do it in a digital way, but at that time we used the shape of a train schedule and you could take it with you and go to places, read about the explanation, talk to your neighbor about it. Next one. Yeah, and so you see how it's Buchenwald, Blechhammer, next one. This is how it's built up, like a schedule. And then, uh, like three years ago, um, these, um, there was a discourse about uh, to whom belongs the city. Um, Barbara Horton and Wilfried Wang created this uh, exhibition about discourse in the city. And they said, can you uh, bring this back? And we discuss it again. So we uh, uh, dis uh, installed an extra large sign of our bus stop schedule uh, and in front of the Academy of Arts in, in Berlin. Because the Holocaust is an uncomfortable topic. Next one. Yeah, and so you see details from the timetable where you could go, for example, this is just a conceptualized abstract schedule. Maybe there is another one. Is there a next one? Ah, yeah. And so our idea was, as there are always these tourists cruising around the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, you know, it's incredibly popular. People are sitting there on stones and so on. And uh, so we said, why not install uh, this bus stop there, so people would think about something, not have just these sightseeing bus tours and so on. This is, these are just some possibilities. Uh, we could go on and on and show about uh, what artists have created in Berlin in terms of discussing the Holocaust and all over Germany. I mean, you have that in Kassel too, you have it in Stuttgart, you have it in Karlsruhe, you have all these research centers. There is the rediscovery of Jewish cemeteries, uh, writers, films, you know, it's, it's, not about, it's not about exposing people, but it's also about bringing back good things, but it's also about exposing evil. Thank you for listening. Are there questions, yeah. contributions? We'd love to have questions from you guys. We can keep talking. Um, we're very good at that. But um, if there are questions, we'd love to have them. Yeah, there's one over there. Hi, thank you very much uh, for your uh, talk. I, I have a question about this um, science in Schöneberg, because they are now there for about 20, 30 years, when they, yes. And I, I ask myself, uh, do they get damaged or something a lot? Or did you have to redo every sign already? Or is there a specific sign that is often damaged? Or Thank you. Ah, well, um, you, you should answer. OK. Um, it's in a very densely populated area. And uh, if you are emotional, if you hate what you see, but it's the truth, it's the historic truth, and you try to uh, throw a stone, mostly if you're emotional, you miss. What you hit is a car. And if you hit a car in Germany, forget about the memorial. Uh, the car is so important. You ran into trouble. And so that's why we have rather no uh, problem with uh, vandal vandalism. And uh, we found out um, when uh, there are three maps where you can start your walk and go through the border, 
uh, there was this glass shattered of one of the maps. And uh, I called the district and said, would you please so kind and bring you, bring you new glass? Four weeks, nothing happened. I told the story to someone and he said, wrong approach. What you didn't say is, it's anti-Semitism. The next day, the glass was in it. So we learned our lesson. Restoration is necessary from time to time because if there is a moving company, the lorries bump into it and then for sure we have to restore it. Uh, sometimes uh, the lacquer pops off and uh, so a little bit. We have another question here. Yes, I would like to uh, follow up on the remark that you made uh, when you talked to... Switch it on. Switch it on. I would like to follow up on a remark you made when you uh, mentioned how you uh, put up those signs and there was this uh, man who yelled at you, uh, go away, pig juice. Um, and you made that remark, this is exactly why we need this memorial. I wonder whether you could uh, explore a little bit how you think the connection is between remembrance, art like that, and the fight against anti-Semitism. Uh, what makes you believe that this kind of art actually really today works to enlighten people and reduce anti-Semitism as a real danger? Well, I think um, as it is so much about information, you know, it's not a romantic memorial where you put stones or where you're intact. It's simply about information. There are facts out there. There are the dates underneath. This is when these... Uh, uh, um, uh, Uh, laws and, and regulations were passed and so it's up to people to think oh that's actually not so bad or to think well this is horrible huh? I mean and also we rewrote the the text it's not the original Nazi language it is and we left it in present tense but added the date underneath so you have a double switch so there are many irritational moments as an artistic methodology but on the whole it's about facts You know, and if somebody is, is not moved by uh, all this information, then I think people are practically dead souls, you know. Then you can't help them, but I think it does help quite a lot of school children who come there every day or students or whoever walks around. Uh, and, and so I think it's a way to do it. And also, that is not my responsibility. It is out there and people can individually react to it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for both of your uh, presentations. I really think they are connected in some ways because as you were saying, talking about facts and as Thomas was saying, It's not just a matter of whether Eichmann was anti-Semite anti or not. That there are facts there too. But I was also thinking, and this is a question for both of you, that there is this unrelentless tendency to transform facts in opinions, like Arendt said in Lying in Politics. Um, and so... When, when you were talking about Eichmann, the book, people didn't read it. They just went on with cliches. They just quoted quotation of quotation. A lot of people didn't read that book and still haven't read that book. And so they tend to simplify the complexity of that book. But I also think because people and especially at the time of the polemics, they didn't want to face the facts from the Jewish point of view and also from the German point of view. So how do you, my question would be, how do you, um, because it's uh, actually last year I was teaching a course and then after the war started, I changed the subject and I, and I, and I taught lying in politics because there was this, thing of denying the facts again, of transforming facts into opinions uh, uh, or into falsifiable things. So I think this is a problem I, I perceive as very urgent still, not only uh, towards anti-Semitism. 
Yeah, thank you so much um, for, for this question and your statement. I think, of course, it's it's an old one of the oldest problems, or um, to turn uh, facts, thinking into opinions since Plato. That is not helpful, maybe to to uh, recall the tradition. But maybe in this specific point, I think it can help to substantiate the whole issue, which means. Um, for, for Arendt, um, in this uh, book, she did not only, as I said before, uh, created a new terminology, the banality of evil, um, but also a new form of presenting it. It's a report, ein Bericht. It's not a historical study. It's not a philosophical treatise. It is not a sociological er, essay. It's none of them. It's something specific. And at the same time, she uses very carefully the idea that even the trial created a, as she says, in the, uh, the human condition and in Vita Activa, a space of appearance, an Erscheinungsraum, which means that opens a space in which we, and here I connect with uh, uh, Renata and Frida, and by the way, we know each other anonymously now for 30 years because I was maybe one of the first persons who uh, were there when they started their art, the monument in 1992, um, but I didn't know that and I don't know these two guys, so I'm happy to connect today for the first time in public. Um, that said, this space of appearance, this Erscheinungsraum means that we get together with completely different experiences, backgrounds, with very different opinions about what is racism, anti-Semitism, and so on and so forth. And it's also part of the documenta, as we all know, and I have to bring it in at, at, a, at a certain point. And then we need, a, I think, also a mature capacity to stand and to accept these different opinions. And when we are lucky, opinions turn again into categories and from categories maybe back to facts. And this very complicated and complex process is also described in Hannah Arendt's Eichmann Jerusalem when she speaks about the witnesses. And there are the more than 100 people who were called by uh, Gideon Hausner and against the three judges, by the way, and against uh, also the rule of the whole trial because they could speak about the experiences and not to the fact that Eichmann was accused to kill or to established the fact killing factories, the so-called concentration camps, Vernichtungslager. And the, the witnesses opened at the same time a different space of appearance, a different uh, space in which facts presented as opinions, as non-proved only by their experiences, a, a new category for historians. And one of the fortunes, so to speak, of the whole controversies is that stupidly, as a, as a, a journalist wrote, uh, thanks to Ulrich Habert, which is a German historian, we know everything about the Holocaust, that is nonsense. Because of the controversies, Wolfgang Scheffler and many, many others, up to David Cesarini and, and many, many others, started doing systematic research of the Holocaust, mostly against Arendt, but depending in, in a negative way, or, uh, on Arendt and on the, let's say, the difference, the very complex difference between opinion and fact. And what we do here is, by the way, exactly that. Exchanging opinions and hopefully getting into something more substantial. And giving more background because simplistic solutions are never good solutions. And when we thought about this competition, Memorial to the Murdered Jews in Europe, we said, so if you forget some, let's find a way. Let's let people go to the um, places of terror and crime and, and killings 
and uh, going there, you think about all the people who were tortured there and killed. So you don't use the Nuremberg race laws of the Nazis to say, who is a Jew that can be named in such a memorial? Because there were homosexuals and, and Roma and, and Sinti killed too, or uh, Soviet prisoners of war, the biggest group of victims in Sachsenhausen, close to Berlin. And that's why we said, let's find a way that you, when you go there, you think about all the people who were tortured and killed there. I want to I want to follow up on Olivia's question about Olivia, whether Olivia will be speaking tomorrow here at five o'clock as part of the uh, a part of this presentation on freedom and art and art. But um, at the beginning of Truth and Politics, the essay that was that was referenced, RN asks a very basic question, which is, does truth have any power in the world? And you know, the essay is one that doesn't have an answer to that question. Um, what she says at some point is, truth may be powerless in the political world. And yet, if we let truth die, the world will disappear because the common world we share, we will flee reality. And so we have to somehow try and build through conversations, trying to make common connections, having difficult conversations, disagreeing with people. We have to somehow build a world we share that we can call a true world. And it strikes me that whether we're talking about Hannah Arendt or we're talking about public art, that has to be part of what we're doing. And I, you know, I, I have many times walked with my app around your, you know, your, your exhibit in Schoenberg but I've never done the buses, and I guess you've never had one of the bus tours. But it strikes me that that's just such an amazing opportunity, the, the auto, the bus tour. I mean, to what extent you saw, and I think you're absolutely right, you put it up there and people do what we want. Have there been discussions that have emerged out of, out of people um, going to the exhibit in Schoenberg? How does, is there a way to facilitate that? How does one think about that? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's on. Oh, yeah, it's on. Okay. Um, well, um, actually, yeah, it's on. Well, um, you know, every day at 10, <laughs> there is a bus tour. I know that because whenever we go there or um, scholars or, or students come from the U.S. a lot um, or from other parts, I don't know what they think and what they say. Sometimes people send letters to us. We have a whole archive. That's very interesting. Sometimes you get a letter out of the blue, somebody from South America. And then you think, wow. And, and, and the person writes to you about the family, very intimate stories. And you, you think, so we have this archive, which we cherish very much. And we are thinking to whom to give it, because it is so precious, I think. Not just to us, but I think in general. Is there a way to make the archive public in some way? Well, how could I? I on the internet I, or some way? Well, give me some assistance. And All right, some, we'll work on it. You know, we can work on that. It Roger. just strikes me that that could be an amazing addition to the exhibit in some. Definitely. Uh, it's, uh, you know, and I also don't think that this ages because this anti-Jewish laws are actually um, human laws. They are against everybody. And every uh, dictatorship acts in the same way. They are always, they, they, you know, they want people to shut up. Look at Putin, this asshole. I mean, he's such a poor, awful person. Can you imagine what happens when he goes to bed and undresses? I mean, it's just awful. And so, uh, and I mean, also undresses mine. I mean, terrible. And we have a war right now in Europe. I mean, this is something that has to be addressed. And in an exhibition like Documenta, I, I remember I was a kid when, when Vietnam happened, and I know that there was the hell going on at Documenta. Actually, Documenta was always really, uh, you know, not about so comfy, uh, you know, so a little bit like, well, how should I say? It looks a little bit to me like the tourist uh, fair every year in, the, in Berlin. You know, you have these huts and, and all that. I think it has to be much more focused and radical 
in a way. That's what I'm missing, what I saw so far. I haven't seen I'm going tomorrow. But, uh, but yes, you have to be political. How can you not be? It's about our existence right now. And whoever doesn't understand it is lost. We have now to act and decide, right? It's so important. Are there other questions? Uh, there was a question on Facebook that I'm going to let Tomas quickly answer. But are there other ones? Yeah, of course. No, no, no. This is more important. It's more important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so someone asked on Facebook, one second, please. Uh, someone asked on Facebook the, the, the title of the biography. It's very simple. It's Hannah Arendt. Biography, Thomas Meyer will appear in English it, in, with Feltrinelli in Italy and other places. Uh, Kalman Levy in Paris, I don't know. The German publishers. Uh, the, the German publishers, Pieper, Ahrens uh, Publishing House in Munich. Please. Still in the same building. Okay, thank you very much. And um, uh, thanks for, thank you for the presentation. And I have a small question that uh, if you using this uh, form of art, like uh, the word, the law that being republished in uh, 1933 uh, uh, and uh, with the picture of the illustration form, which is very modern and uh, in the form of kind of like comic. Uh, uh, do you think actually the fact or, or the truth could be weakened in the form of uh, in that ways of uh, in that ways of expression, when you talk to the people, talk, talk to the public, uh, and yes, uh, I think the public can accept this kind of uh, art form uh, easily. Uh, but, uh, but sorry, but um, maybe the truth and the fact has been weakened, like the words uh, that they say that you then cannot keep a pet. That that. Is exactly the same way my house lord told to me that I cannot keep a pet in my apartment too. So uh, that was kind of like the same, but the evil is, uh, it's not evil. The house lord, what the house lord told me, but it's just a rule. But um, for me, it's like kind of like um, the truth and fact being weakened, and uh, maybe it should be stayed, it should stay in the I don't know how to say in the something more true or more uh, uh, realistic or such kind of things, maybe. Um. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, when you do something, you st you sh start to discuss it, and what? How do you succeed when you go in public space? If you create anger, it might vanish instantly, like the tilted arc by Richard Zara on a public uh, square where people are annoyed by looking at metal when they have their lunch on their knees and uh, suddenly it vanishes. Uh, when we put up the signs in a height of more than three meters, you have to lift your glance by five degrees to see it. So you can live in this area looking on the ground not to step in dog shit and you never see a sign maybe for two years and suddenly your kid asks a question, why is that image up there? And you as an adult, you have to come up with an explanation. And there is a text on the back, and you have to explain something. And you pass a message on. You have to interpret that regulation, that law up there. And it's a very complex issue. And uh, so, there are always different ways uh, to cope with this, but uh, that's the way we thought about it, and uh, it's up for 30 years, but unfortunately, it's not under protection yet. It's an official memorial, but we want it to be under protection because times are changing, and you never know if someone goes against it. Um, may I add something? Uh, it's a very important question you ask. Um, Arendt is even more radical. So also lying is part of the human capacity. And because of that, and we do it constantly, and we maybe it's uh, something that is, uh, as, I, as I said, part of the condition of the human being, we have to include also lying, truth, lying, um, 
is a has a complex relationship in which we, as uh, Frida Schnock said, have to start the the concept of conversation, and out of that we can re install the difference between lying and truth. But that means not that truth is something like a, let's say, substantial unity. It is something that is divided in itself. There's an old fashioned differentiation made by Leibniz, used by Arendt many times. It's the differentiation between Tatsachenwahrheiten and Vernunftwahrheiten. I will translate it immediately. Truth because of reason and truth because of facts. And the interrelation, the, the, the correlation between these two things needs another explanation. That means you stabilize, so to speak, truth in, in different fields and in different uses, forms. The, 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 the connection between form and content plays an important role. So the, the, a word that sounds a little bit like Heidegger, because it's a phenomenological description, it's not only Wahrheit as in the sense of one plus one is two, but also Wahrheit in the, in the sense of Wahrheitsgeschehen, um, which means that truth is a process means a complete space on its own. And that is m more up to uh, uh, what we, I think, are losing when we look at this uh, guy in, uh, in America, for example, and uh, Renata mentioned another one. Uh, and the constant fight is not only to, to make sure that one plus one is still two, but what I described as Wahrheitsgeschehen uh, must be established in the same way. Thank you. Other questions, comments? If not, I can close it. It's fine. Yeah, we can. Do you want to say anything else? No, that's fine. It's fine with us. All right, so um, I want to thank uh, Tomas, Renata, and Frida. And I want to thank Tanya Regera for having us. Uh, a reminder of two things. Tomorrow, um, hi, Tanya. Uh, tomorrow, Tanya's final, the Instar's final exhibit here at Documenta 15 will open, I think, at 8 or 10 a.m. in this room right here. And it'll be uh, around Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem and the banality of evil. So I invite you back for that. And at 5 o'clock, um, Olivia Geraldo and I will be talking about Hannah Arendt again uh, here at 5 o'clock tomorrow. So I invite you back for that as well. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy Documenta. Thanks very much. And thank you very much for it.